she said, ah! no, I'm joking. You don't. You do not have to. Oh, and I'm not going to trick them. You do not have to. The goal of this session is to give you all some ideas of companies, startups that we need in this space to help save over 70% of the planet. So we do have a wonderful conversation between Emmanuel and Al about these possible business opportunities. And uh, we hope that you'll get some ideas. We hope that you'll learn some stuff. We hope that you enjoy the pizza. And we really do thank you for coming. If you decide to participate in the Ocean Vision Startup Competition, we're sending a link to everybody who is here. Okay, so if you are a ZP, you are going to get a link in order to apply for the competition specifically. We'll submit an idea, you'll just check a box to say you want to be in the Ocean Vision Competition, and then we'll move forward. We'll send you more follow up details after. All right? Okay, so I just want to say a few words of how this competition is going to play. Uh, so just recently we launched here on campus a new initiative called Ocean Visions. And the idea behind this initiative is to essentially find ocean solutions to science and engineering. And with that in mind, a few months ago we met with Al and Al thought this is a great idea. We should actually have startups that uh, look for ocean solutions. And so what we thought we would do is uh, together with this initiative and all the Georgia setting that, and also with CreateX for Joy. We thought we launched this uh, Ocean Vision Startup Competition this year. So this competition starts essentially as soon as you start submitting your ideas. And it will last uh, uh, approximately until April. And then in April, there's going to be essentially the announcement of the winner team. And this will actually take place uh, at the aquarium. And we'll be hosted there and we'll have a closer session and a little event there. So tonight, we are here really to, to get you guys uh, some ideas of the problem going. And we have Al Doe, who's a Vice President for Research at the Aquarium. Uh, he has a PhD in Zoology and Parasitology from the University of Queensland, Queensland, 1994. He's a bit older than me. And, uh, and he's a world expert currently in whale sharks, right? If I say that correct. Um, but he's also, of course, uh, uh, done a lot of work in uh, conservation ecology. Now, joining us are also two faculty from the program in Ocean Science Engineering that are back there. Uh, one is uh, Herman Fritz. He's a coastal engineer with expert in disaster tsunamis and earthquakes, so to, that's his specialty. And we have Mark Hay, uh, who's an expert in, uh, let's say, conservation ecology. But fair enough. There you go. And then uh, myself, I'm Emanuel Di Lorenzo, I'm a climate and ocean science, I'm more of a physical scientist. And then I also would like to acknowledge some of the PhD students from the program in Ocean Science Engineering that came here tonight to, to give us support and hopefully go and the competition. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge Marty, who's the Chief uh, Marketing Officer of the Georgia Aquarium, who's also here. And uh, without further ado, let's hear from Al, from the work from the... Uh, we got it. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me here. And I want to acknowledge one more person, uh, and that's uh, one who just walked in the door. Wait for everybody. Arthur works for a real life startup. So, uh, if you have questions about how you get from where you are now to where he is, I'm going to just put him on the spot and say you can ask him after. So, my job today, I guess, is to help define for you the problem space. Like, what are we dealing with here? Uh, and it might seem odd that we would be addressing ocean challenges in a landlocked city. <laughs> but it might also seem odd that you would have the world's largest aquarium in the same landlocked <laughs> city. And nevertheless, it's true. So it is true that Georgia Tech has a great deal of ocean expertise, <clears throat> including such distinguished people as Professor Hay, who uh, is a, a real leader in the area of coral reef ecology. Uh, and there's a great concentration in the biological sciences group where I'm an adjunct faculty member, um, especially looking at coral reefs and the chemical ecology that happens in those amazing ecosystems. But I want to back out much further today and just talk about uh, the ocean and some of the ocean challenges that we're facing today. So the best place to start is to ask yourself, what is the ocean doing for us? It's easy to say that it covers 71% of the planet, what does that actually mean for the rest of us? Um, well, in the US, it means that 60% of us are living within 60 miles of the coast. And that's relevant when the big storms come in, as we did with Florence last week, but it's relevant for everybody. There is a natural gravitation of humans towards coastlines, and we all tend to live uh, fairly close to the coast, and that's important when you think about what the ocean does for us. 
about half of the air you're breathing right now, the oxygen will come it's not from forests, but from phytoplankton in the ocean. Nearly everybody assumes that oxygen comes from trees. That's half right. The other half comes from phytoplankton in the ocean. So if you don't think the ocean is helping you, uh, skip every other breath and see how well you do. <laughs> about 90% of international commerce takes place by ship. Um, it's really an extraordinary amount. The, the total global commercial shipping fleet is 55,000 ships, and they do about 90% of global commerce. You just don't see it most of the time. You might see it if you live in a port city. You might see it if you happen to go out in the middle of the ocean like I do from time to time. You will see great highways of enormous ships that move everything you can imagine uh, from one place to another, including probably the chairs that you sit on. Protein for about 3 billion people every day. And this is a big one because if we're going to keep feeding a growing world population and we're going to continue to have a growth mindset which seems to be something inescapable for most people, we've got to find a way to feed them all. And protein is a key part of that and ocean is a key part of that protein picture. Where it gets really interesting to me is that the ocean has absorbed more than 25% of all the greenhouse gases that have been emitted since the Industrial Revolution. So that's CO2 that has gone straight into the ocean. That means that CO2 is not contributing to the greenhouse effect because it's dissolving the water, not in the atmosphere, but it's doing things in the ocean as well as we'll see in a moment. And on the, the, of the stuff that's gone into the atmosphere and trapped a bunch of heat through the greenhouse effect, more than 90% of that heat has been absorbed directly by the water. As most of you will know, the specific heat capacity of water is very, very high. And so the ocean acts as a giant heat sponge, sucking that trapped heat out of the atmosphere and storing it mostly in the top couple hundred meters of the ocean, which is a giant heat sponge. It's also receiving about 8 million tons of plastic trash annually. And that's a figure that was derived right here in the state of Georgia, actually, at down the road in Athens. Uh, where Jenna Jambeck at the University of Georgia led a group, an MC group, <coughs> came up with that first global estimate of how much plastic trash is going into the ocean. That estimate is now pushing 10 years old, and we're quite sure that it's probably close to double that at this point. So, so that's the last scientific group, a validated estimate. If you really break it down, the problems that we have with the ocean uh, come down to putting too much of some things in and taking too much of other things out. The things that we put too much in, you could call them all pollution if you want, but I separated a couple of special cases there. CO2 pollution, you could be open, that's a real thing too. We could call that CO2 pollution or heat pollution or noise pollution, plastic pollution, chemical pollution, and metal pollution. These are all things that we're putting too much of in. That's the definition of pollution, too much of it going in there. And then on the other end, too much extractive activity, which for our purposes tonight, let's just focus on <coughs> taking out too much in the way of digging necessary to feed the 7 billion and growing population that we have. So at its very simplest, too much in, too much out, and it's unbalanced system, so uh, you need to work with that. Within that, of course, is a dizzying array of complex problems that we all have to try to get our heads around, and which you guys are going to turn your brains to solving. Um, and those occur at all kinds of scales, as we'll see. Let's have a look at some of them then. So ocean acidification, this is the problem where the CO2 is dissolving into the seawater, becomes part of a complex carbonate chemistry pathway, it's reversible, so you can push the chemistry in different directions. But at its most basic, it's lowering the pH of the global ocean. It's down about 0.1 so far since the Industrial Revolution, which doesn't sound like much, but of course the pH scale is logarithmic, so it's bigger than it sounds. And it's also the life that lives in the ocean, especially on coral reefs, for example, is but very finely tuned to narrow ranges of pH tolerance, cannot deal with deviation. Uh, 0.1 might not seem like a lot when you're explaining it to people at the pub on a Thursday night, but it is actually a significant problem for animals that live in the ocean. Why it's a problem, amongst other things, is that it interferes with chemistry of depositing your skeleton. Lots of animals that live in the ocean have calcium carbonate skeletons and other types of calcium skeletons, and all of those animals listed there have trouble making skeletons if, if the carbonate chemistry is not favorable. But we're starting to learn some other interesting things that ocean acidification does too, and some of them are fairly unexpected. So one of the things that's come out fairly recently is that larval fish require particular chemical signals in the water in order to detect the reefs or other habitats for which they want to recruit. So these larval fish are floating around in the plankton, they're sniffing around for coral reefs, and when they sniff one, they drop out of the plankton, metamorphose, and become the pretty, pretty colorful fish that we all know. 
And that process of detecting those chemical signals is pH dependent. And when the ocean acidifies, the ability of larval fish to find the right place for them to settle out and metamorphose is interfered with. And so you end up with recruitment failure and you don't have the fish that you need uh, on the reef and all of the things that come with that. And if you'd like to know more about that, there is a great expert in the room. So Dr. Hay is definitely the guy you want to talk to. So here's a global map. This is not a uniform process, right? There are certain parts of the ocean, like the far northern north, <laughs> where the pH has dropped much more than other places. Uh, but overall, the net effect is that the pH has definitely dropped uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And that's changing things all over the place. Heat goes the other way. Uh, we wouldn't put too much heat in. This is mostly from greenhouse effects, mostly in the top 200 meters. And this is a big deal because most of the animals, with the exception of marine mammals that live in the ocean, are <coughs> uh, cold blooded. They're phototerms. So the speed of their metabolism and all kinds of biological processes that they rely on is driven by the prevailing temperature. When the temperature changes, everything changes. The timing of, of productivity changes, uh, migratory paths change, fundamental um, uh, distributions of animals change under different temperature regimes. And at its most extreme, we get crank disease and death. You must have all heard about the two major bleaching events that have taken place on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia over the last couple of years. Uh, in the first year, the top half, or top third of the reef bleached. In the second year, the, the middle third of the reef bleached. So we lost two thirds of the Great Barrier Reef uh, in two years. And a lot of that is driven by um, uh, persistent temperature stress, which again, does not have to be particularly great. It only takes one or two degrees Celsius for a couple of weeks above what they used to to uh, tip a coral over into the bleaching condition, which is one step closer to the death. Corals can recover from bleaching. They can uh, <coughs> recover the algal symbionts that they have and, and get back to normal health, but not if the temperature stress is prolonged. So these more frequent and more severe temperature anomalies cause corals uh, to ultimately end up dying. It can do all sorts of other things. You've probably heard about mistimed migration for birds and insects on land. That happens in the water as well. So temperature is the great throttle of life. And in the ocean, perhaps more so than anywhere else. And so this increasingly warming oceans is changing everything. You can see it come down to Georgia Aquarium. We have African penguins at the aquarium. One of the most common penguins that you'll see in public aquariums, because it's a temperate penguin. You don't have to keep the exhibit super cold for African penguins to be happy. But ironically enough, it's one of the rarest penguins in nature because the 10,000 or so birds that are left between South Africa and Namibia are highly affected <coughs> by this business, mistimed productivity and changing current patterns and food is shifting. The birds are not able to get from where they lay their eggs to where they want to fish. Uh, in time, they haven't got the swimming range and they're losing birds a lot. So this, these things are happening right now in the ocean. Where does all of this come from? Well, it's got greenhouse gases, but I wanted to put a special mention in there for the commercial shipping fleet for a couple of reasons. One is that commercial shipping fleet, those 55,000 commercial ships I mentioned earlier, uh, they got a pass in Paris. Uh, so they were exempted from all the international agreements that all the different countries were agreeing to about how to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Shipping was left out of that. That makes no sense at all. Those 55,000 ships emit more CO2 than all of the cars and buses of the world put together. So how does it make any sense to leave them out? It doesn't. Plus, the fuel that they burn, you can see it there, they call it number two heavy fuel oil or bunker fuel, is gross. When you've, when you've gone through the distillation process and you've removed every other <coughs> fuel that has any value whatsoever, what you're left with is number two bunker fuel. It's brown or black sludge like that. Uh, and when you burn it, it produces a tremendous amount of fine particulate ash and a lot of sulfur as well. Um, and many ships are required to burn cleaner fuels when they're in port or within the national waters of different countries. As soon as they get out into international waters, they flip over from burning diesel into burning this stuff. And it's gross. So okay, you better take them. Yep. How do you make this compared to the amount of fuel burning by? I don't know. I don't actually have a good idea about how much planes burn. I know, obviously, for most of us, the biggest carbon footprint we have is that the moment we fly to our vacation destination, um, we burn more to get there than we do 
in the rest of our lives together. So yes, flying has a huge carbon footprint. One of the reasons why one of the uh, big innovation competitions around here is called Ocean Exchange down in uh, Savannah every October. That is sponsored by two companies, Melania Small Hilton, Jipping, and Gulfstream Jets. Very fuel thirsty jets that they have. But it's worth thinking, it's worth thinking about this stuff because this is happening out of sight, out of mind. Every time ships leave port and they switch from burning the clean fuel to burning the nasty stuff that leaves giant ash flakes all over the deck of the boat. That's why they have clean boats when they get in. And it really is pretty nasty. And that stuff's all settling out on the ocean uh, and doing all sorts of damage there too. Yes. So there's been a lot of talk in the ocean community of whether we should take all this stuff that we have to clean and whether how to build the atmosphere. We put it somewhere in the deep ocean to the extent we never see the atmosphere, or at least it doesn't stick to our own. So that's not the solution in the long run, but over 100 years, maybe we'll have enough time to put it out. Yeah. You know, talk about ocean fertilization as a solution at the moment, so way to do it. The one that's in the news a ton at the moment is pollution, specifically plastic pollution. We hear a lot about uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And you see images like this one. This is a diver popping up in the middle of the garbage patch. This is not in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Almost none of the photos you see associated with those stories are actually taken in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Because if you actually went out there and took a picture of it, it would look like a regulation bit of ocean. It is true that they are heavily enriched compared to the rest of the ocean in plastic particles, but the absolute number of plastic particles amounts to about 100 small particles per Olympic swimming pool of water. So that is not what's happening here. They choose these pictures, coastal pictures, for dramatic editorial effect, but that's not what the Great Pacific Garbage Patch looks like. I don't mean to diminish the problem. It is an enormous problem, but we have to be aware of how it gets distorted in the media as well. Plastic pollution is tracking a tremendous amount of research attention right now, uh, and it is uh, so far evading many attempts to ameliorate the problem. There's lots of design opportunities here. There's lots of chemical material engineering solutions here, product design solutions. There's also um, amelioration solutions. We'll talk about a couple of those in a minute. And those work at different spatial scales and different plastic scales too, because plastic can be big pieces of nylon rope used in, in commercial fishing, or it can be nano particles that are consumed by the very smallest plankton and concentrate their way up the food web. And we don't know yet what impacts a lot of those plastics <coughs> are having, but we know that plastic is now completely ubiquitous in the marine environment. There are no places that are free of plastic pollution. Are noise pollution? Are you yeah. pollution here about noise? Yes, so noise pollution is a big deal from those 55,000 <coughs> ships I was telling you about. They make a tremendous amount of noise. Uh, and animals that live in the ocean tend to live in a very auditory world. Animals like whales, for example, who listen to each other over long distances. And the frequency bands that they like to listen to are often occupied now by constant thrumming or humming or groaning sounds from ships as they come past. And there is evidence, published evidence, that uh, whales have to shift their vocal range and sing higher or lower so that they can get around the ranges that are being filled by commercial shipping. I have a quick question about microplastics. Yes. Um, you said they don't really know the effects of it yet. Like, uh, why don't they really know the effects? Right. So there's been a number of studies. We just had the Sixth International Marine Debris Conference in San Diego earlier this year. I was there. There were a lot of papers presented where people were talking about ingestion. If you look at all these animals, everybody's ingesting plastic. The real link that's missing so far is does that lead to death, disease, juiced? Out, reproductive output, that's the bit that's missing, the mechanistic link between ingesting all that stuff. You can go you can go out there and cut open any fish you like, or coca or crab, or bird, or whatever you want, or mammal, mammal. you'll find plastic. But the question is, that's killing you. There, there are two main mechanisms we think about for that. We call it the one-two punch. The one punch is obstruction. You eat too much plastic, it literally blocks your gut. One of the few papers at that conference that was really influential was someone finally published a number of how many pieces of plastic a turtle has to eat before it will die. The answer is 14. Uh, so it's not many, as long as they're reasonable sized pieces of plastic. That's the one punch, obstruction. The number two punch is toxicity. So one of the things that happens with all this plastic floating around is that it becomes a magnet for uh, hydrophobic chemicals, pollution, organic contaminants that float around and don't want to be in 
aqueous solutions. They want to stick to something that's hydrophobic. And a lot of surfaces of these plastic particles are hydrophobic. So the chemicals adhere, absorb to the outside of the plastic particles. Animals eat them. Then they encounter the low pH enzymatic environment of the stomach and the intestine. And all of those chemical pollutants are released from the surface of the plastic particle. And it becomes, we call a poison pill effect. Uh, where the plastic itself might not feed you, but the persistent organic pollutants that are stuck on the outside of it won't give you any good at all. As an aside, I want to thank you to work with our organs for your poison neighbors. That's a sweet, isolated phthalate that you're from the plastic <clears throat> that we're pulling either out of these organisms or as they always do. We don't think anything. And they are coming out of everything. So don't microwave your dinner in plastic. Yes. So the scale of plastic we're talking about, the micro gets down to the nano where it can actually go out into the bloodstream, across the blood barrier, and you actually have particles of plastic in muscular flesh. Flesh. Yeah. Um, so it, there's there's plastic particle scales down to the intracellular, so it's it's ubiquitous. And what it all means, yet yeah, we we don't know. So it's, it's definitely something to think. Uh, so just so that this isn't rarefied, I wanted to show you a couple of pictures of actual plastic pollution I've experienced in the course of being a field marine biologist. This was in Bali, which is often regarded as the epicenter, the global epicenter of the plastic pollution problem. I took a walk on the beach one morning early, so I jet lag. I was there for the World Ocean Summit. And this is the beach in front of the hotel where the World Ocean Summit was taking place. And it's completely covered in plastic trash. Came back an hour later, it was all gone. And people in Bali just got used to go and break all the stuff up and bury it so that the tourists don't have to see the ice or. Uh, but it's a, this is nearly all local plastic that was being generated in and around Bali, or that part of Indonesia at least. But I've also seen it much further afield. This is the tiny South Atlantic uh, island of St. Helena. And on the beach there, which is a black sand beach, everything you can see that's not black is plastic. And this, this is the end of the line. This is the white noise of plastic that's left after all of these consumer products weather in the open ocean for months to years. And they break down into these completely anonymous bits of white and colored plastic that wash up on the beach there. It's completely covered with the stuff. Uh, and it's not special. Every remote island you go to, Northwest Hawaiian Islands, Galapagos, St. Helena, Indonesia, all these places are completely covered with plastic. <clears throat> this was uh, the yield from one four-inch circle that I pushed, a little quadrat that I pushed down into the sand, had 1,400 particles of plastic. A lot of them were nurdles. There's a nurdle right there. Nurdles are feedstock plastic pellets that have never been made into anything. So what are they doing on a beach? Well, it turns out that hundreds of shipping containers fall overboard from ships every year, and lots of them are full of these plastic nurdles. So you actually end up with feedstock plastics that wash up as well. There's also, I was told, a fair number of um, bio pellets in here as well, which come from um, sewage treatment works, where they have big bio bead filters that they use for treating human waste in sewage treatment plants, and those blow through from time to time as well and make their way out into the ocean. It's a huge, huge problem. Fishing, huge, huge problem. From the near extinction of really key species like the bluefin tuna, uh, we know now from the uh, fishing, global fishing yield, which is the blue part, basically flattened off for the last few decades. Um, that's not to say that nobody's trying. To maintain that fishing effort, uh, we've had to fish harder and harder and harder every year. So there's a law of diminishing returns going on. To keep that yield the same, a little bit under 100 million tons, uh, they are having to fish harder and harder every year and bring to bear every bit of technology they can to literally <coughs> screw every last fish out of some of the parts of the ocean. You can also see how rapidly aquaculture is growing. And we now know that if we're going to feed the 9 billion people population, a lot of that's going to have to come from aquaculture. And aquaculture is going to need some creative brains too to solve some of the challenges that they had about how to feed animals, how to keep water quality up, and how to increase yield uh, without having to use one animal to feed another animal, which is one of the problems of that problem. Uh, it's, everybody picks on the Chinese about industrialized fishing, but perhaps not without 
some ports. There's definitely a huge issue there, but they have a huge population as well uh, that they need to feed. Uh, and it gets to be a very contentious issue. Fishing is really a hot subject with lots of problems. And there are technologies in the fishing, but there are technologies in the way we want the fishing to do it. Other fishing issues, bycatch is a huge issue. So this is a shrimp trawler. How much of what you see on the sorting table there is actually shrimp? Um, a pretty small portion. Uh, there are a huge number of animals that die just because they got caught in the wrong net. They didn't happen to be a shrimp. So that poor dog fish not belong to this world because uh, he happened to be uh, in the water. You can see the scallops as well and all the other animals, even the kelp. So these things are basically clear felling the bottom of the ocean. So trawling, which used to be a really popular technique with the fishing when I was younger, these days this otter trawl has become a very unpopular mechanism for fishing because it basically destroys any habitat structure whatsoever. And it's a completely indiscriminate method where the doors and the chain that, that lines the bottom of the net just basically clear fill everything and catch everything. And then you throw back everything that you've got once, which is most of it, unfortunately. It's a very, very inefficient way of harvesting the ocean. Some of you might have seen this in the news recently. 300 olive ridley turtles that got caught in an old trawl net uh, off the coast of Mexico. They're all dead. Uh, so they're endangered species. Uh, one piece of ghost fishing gear for them all. All right, so enough do the glue. What about some solutions? This is intended to give you some ideas about some of the ideas that are already floating out there to maybe stimulate your thought processes, what you might want to do, or which issues you might want to solve. They could be very simple mechanical devices. That last turtle example I showed you, deliberate segue to showing you the turtle excluder device, which is a door in a trawl net that allows turtles to get out. So the fish carry on through these slotted bars, you can see back here. And the turtles are able to push down a little trapdoor flap and get out the back of the net. And this has reduced turtle mortality tremendously. So these solutions don't have to be high tech. Some of them are very distinctly low tech. In fact, low tech solutions work really well in fishing, where the duty cycle on things tends to be pretty rough on equipment. So the lower tech solutions are sometimes the better. So that's a very simple mechanical solution that prevented a lot of turtle mortality. Goes all the way to the other extreme. Google and a couple of satellite companies got their brains together to improve monitoring of the global commercial fishing fleet through something called Global Fishing Watch, which combines real-time satellite uh, information about where ships are, because ships have to carry a uh, satellite transmitter to tell you which the ship is and where it is and what it's doing. And they combined that with the big data tools that they had at Google to tell you where is the global fishing fleet right now? And what's it doing? And are they obeying the marine protected areas that are increasingly popping up all over the ocean? And this is a very powerful tool that's now allowing <coughs> sovereign governments and NGOs to watch carefully what's happening in the commercial fishing world. So here's a solution that uses big data and big algorithms to choose huge amounts of information uh, to provide benefits. And you can see that generally speaking, they are observing the EEZ of Australia, generally speaking. Or they're shutting off their satellite transmitters when they cross Australian borders. That's equally possible too. So maybe you want to come up with a solution of a satellite AIS transmitter that cannot be shut off by the person who's driving the boat. Some solutions are about science. This is a liquid robotics wave glider. So these things are out in the ocean, autonomous vehicles that drive around the ocean gathering information about the water column underneath them. So we get information about water temperature that might tell us about an impending storm, for example from devices like this that drive around the ocean uh, surveying the water column. So if you're into autonomous vehicles and robotics and things like that, uh, there's certainly plenty of uh, meat there that needs to be solved as well. And there's also a bunch of different scales. So here's three different <coughs> solutions for the same problem at different scales. So this is the plastic problem. And here's the big scale solution, the ocean cleanup. Um, so this is the grandchild of a 19-year-old Dutch guy called Boyd Slack. And his basic idea was to get these big U-shaped booms uh, and run them out to the big uh, North Pacific garbage patch and let the, the circular currents of the ocean gather all the plastic for you in these big plastic booms. You ask me, this is not going to work. But the fact is the guy came up with a creative solution. He's raised money for it, and they're out there trying it right now. Don't think it's going to work, but I applaud him for actually trying something. To me, this is the ultimate case of closing the gate after the horse has long since bolted because 
you're trying to catch up the plastic at its most dilute when it's out there in the open ocean. You'd be much better off doing something like this. This is the Baltimore trash wheel, which some of you guys may know. It lives in the Jones Falls Creek in Baltimore. When I first saw this trash wheel, I probably fell in love with it, and his friend, Professor Trash Wheel, she's just as cool. Uh, and they're now uh, sitting there chomping away on the uh, plastic trash that washes off the hardened surface of the Baltimore. And they catch it up. They let the, the watershed do all the work for them, right? The watershed catches all the trash every time it rains, washes it all into a, a unidirectional linear flow that can be intercepted. And that's what Mr. Trash Wheel does. So it just sits there at the mouth of the river just before this trash would go into the harbor and grabs up all the plastic and puts it in the dumpster. Doesn't that seem like it's much more likely to work than this <laughs> solution? Um, and this is considerably. <coughs> yes. What size of plastic is that biology? Yeah. So it grabs everything that floats. Uh, so it doesn't matter how big or small because the booms have a little uh, skirt underneath them. Um, and then in the front there, there is a slow conveyor belt that lifts from off that surface layer. So the water gathers in, in right in front of the thing and it just literally lifts it all up. There's a couple of aluminium pine cones that actually rake the stuff onto the conveyor belt, lifts it all up. So it's it's not discriminating on size, it's discriminating on density. So anything that floats, which means it does get a lot of non-plastic debris as well, gets logs. It's the, the biggest problem they have is woody debris that comes down the stream during big storms. They can lift and do lift a 2,000 pound log with one of these. Um, in terms of biology, it moves quite slowly, and they find that nearly all animals have been able to just get off the sides. They have had a number of turtles, the occasional snake. They're still waiting for their first human body. That hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but they do understand that it's going to happen one day, probably, if they'll have somebody float by. But so far, they have not seen the dumpster full of wildlife, which is something that they were obviously very worried about at the beginning. But it moves slowly enough that most animals seem to be able to get away. Yeah. Right, so you guys know about <coughs> dark matter in the universe, right? There's all this missing matter that we, we can't find. There's, there's dark matter plastic too. So we, we know we're missing probably 60% of plastic, uh, and we think it's probably on the bottom. Actually, we know it's on the bottom for a large part. So one of the things that's wrong-headed about both of these solutions is that it's only focusing on the plastic fraction that actually floats, which means you're selecting certain resins that are less dense than seawater. Uh, but there are huge forces. PVC, for example, does not float. So any PVC fragment is going to sink to the bottom. Definitely something to keep in mind. That you are, even when you're getting everything like you are here, you're only getting everything that floats. And everything that's in the water column, and everything that's moving saltatory fashion along the bottom, plastic chunks that are rolling on the bottom, you're not getting any of those. Not with a solution for that stuff. I just Right, so it's even more than a sixty percent. Even the floating resins sink when they become biofoul. So your little piece of floating polypropylene gets covered in barnacles. So again, this is a much better solution than the right. I have been trying to get one of these in Peach Street Creek for the longest time. So we're still working on it. And here's an even smaller scale. This is the sea bin project. They just this is the idea of putting it right at the source. So the idea of put these sea bins in marinas. A lot of trash comes from marinas. So put a sea bin at, at the end of every dock in the marina, and you can catch the trash before it even gets out into the waterway. So between those three different projects, you can see the three different scales that they've approached the problem. And you can scale your thinking as well for whatever project it is that you're interested in. How does that work? Yeah, so the top of it is just set, the buoyancy is set to be just below the surface, and water is constantly cascading over this edge. And there is just simply a soft bag filter in there that catches the plastic and everything else that floats. You can see this one's getting a fair amount of seagrass. Um, catches a lot of stuff. Uh, that's what you need to do. Uh, again, people in all three of these cases are focused very much on the uh, density as the way that they're discriminating what you're trying to collect. Some of these ideas are pretty pie in the sky. This is Melanius's or cell <coughs> So this is a concept 
design of a green ship, largely autonomous, wind and solar driven. Uh, I don't know that they're going to get there, but just wanted to let you let you know that there are solutions floating out there that are pretty pretty pie in the sky kind of things. Um, and then uh, Dr. Di Lorenzo mentioned before the idea of sequestering carbon dioxide in the bottom of the ocean. This is a chemical concept, so this isn't a, a product at all. This is the idea of, okay, maybe we can solve the CO2 problem by going out and fertilizing the ocean with the, the limiting nutrient, which in ocean systems isn't nitrogen or phosphorus, it's iron. So if you go out of the ocean and spread iron chloride all over the place, bioavailable iron, uh, it's no longer the limiting nutrient. Get huge algal blooms. Those sponsor more fish for your fishing, so you get a free lunch while you're at it. And then they take all that CO2 and they sequester it down to the bottom of the ocean. But I can't remember who said it, but there is no free lunch in chemistry ever. So that CO2 is going to come back to you sometime, uh, even if you sequester it to the bottom of the ocean. But, so there was a very influential experiment called SOFEX, the Southern Island Iron Enrichment Experiment that was done where they actually went out and did this, <coughs> tested this notion. It worked really well. They were able to create a big, uh, a big plankton blue that they could see from space. And then the United Nations quickly put a moratorium on further experiments of that nature before anybody got crazy idea of going out. You maybe know more about this one. Has anybody? You know, all I wanted to say is that in principle, if you can actually store some of this uh, carbon in the atmosphere, you can close your that would buy us a lot of time, but we're talking about growing. The problem with the iron fertilization is that even though you grow all these plants, get this carbon in the atmosphere, put it in surface plants, when they die, they don't necessarily sink at the bottom of the ocean. But before they sink, they get remineralized, and this stuff gets by the back into the atmosphere. So it may not have an efficient process if you have to think of it. That's the big problem, one of them. If you did not to eat it quick enough and it's very typically to a small white hole, then that's where we get some problems. That's why we eat whales, whale sharks to be out there all the time. So, um, uh, and I wanted to finish with the last one, and this is kind of a tip for a friend of mine who works at the Bureau of Ocean Energy. He's starting a similar uh, innovation contest where they're trying to get to revolutionize animal tracking. I tag a lot of animals to find out where they go, mostly wild ducks and kangaroos. We're stuck with the same six uh, Argos legacy satellites that have been up there since 1976, um, and they don't work very well. He's trying to take an approach encouraging people to use CubeSats, these small scale, uh, cheap satellites that you can throw a whole swarm of these things up there, uh, but we need people to come up with um, more creative communication protocols uh, better ways to serialize data and, and get it to bounce around between these different assets, better ways to get that information to us. The tags themselves now are actually really cool. Uh, they're, they're very, very capable. It's actually getting the tag to stay on, come off when it's supposed to, and give its data back to you. That's the hardest thing for us to do. So if you're interested in looking up that, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and NASA have an animal next generation animal tracking contest going on as well. So there are um, any number of solutions you can come up with and they can be space-based solutions. Actually, space and satellites is one of the most useful tools oceanographers ever have. Looking at the ocean is a big place. The easiest way to look to is from space. So um, those are just some of the solutions that I uh, hope will encourage you to think about your own problems and how you might like to solve them. And, and good luck, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. So I was going to have Paul sit here, and I was going to call Mark, Herman, and Jacque, who are faculty in the And at this regard, I, I was also going to mention uh, today I'll explain a lot of the problems that are going, you know, that are related to the living component of the ocean and some of the plastics. But we also have a whole bunch of issues in but that are really related more like with coastal engineering. And a lot of people live at the coast. And so I wanted to, to maybe ask Herman, who's a coastal engineer who actually deals with a lot of these problems, I'll say with hurricane destruction and stuff, you know, what kind of problems, you know, are seeking solutions, you know, in coastal environments? Well, there's an increasing amount of the wolf population that's living on the coast, so and population pressure is increasing. 
Uh, just came back from Indonesia. We have large cities like Jakarta or Nosko, Nosko, Jala, Semarang, and so forth. But there's a lot of subsidence in some of these cities. There's subsidence of half a foot per year. So you have the land going down very, very fast. And in one of the towns in Indonesia, it's uh, the solution where basically the houses are sinking. I was wondering why, and I'm not that tall, why is basically the door being almost gone? And then I figured out that essentially what they were doing is the houses were sinking and they were just filling in dirt or, or the soil around it to kind of try to keep up uh, with, the, with the sinking land. So there's a lot of vulnerability issues, uh, overpopulation on the coast and so forth. Um, there are a lot of potential solutions there in nature base, you know, with mangroves and so forth, trying to, for example, capture more sediment that's washed out into the ocean. So um, that naturally gains the land back um, rather than just dumping it to uh, uh, channelized rivers somewhere out in the deep part of the ocean. Um, then there are, of course, also hard solutions. In Japan, hard solutions are very popular. In the U.S., pretty much not doable, but in Japan, the rocky boats for hard solutions with sea walls and uh, breakwaters and so forth are also possibilities. Um, and there are, of course, also in that context, in the U.S. it's more levees in Louisiana and so forth, so it's a little bit uh, New Orleans. Uh, but then there's also the possibility to try to integrate, you know, structure with renewable energy as well. Rather than just having a levee, perhaps it's also serving the coastal lagoon that's harvesting tidal energy and things like that. Um, those are things that have been discussed for a long time and materialized in places where renewable like that, the same estuary in the United Kingdom. Um, then, of course, there's also, you know, harvesting energy for, for waves, for example. So, point absorbers, very popular. So, doing experiments this summer at Oregon, a large wave based on tsunamis, but uh, unrelated to that, on the Oregon coast, there's also a uh, test site for uh, wave energy devices. So, in a, in a plume in the wave laboratory, there were small scale devices by startup companies that are funded by the Department of Energy and so forth, uh, being tested in an offshore there, and so these prototypes here, one to four or full scale, uh, that are, that are being, being tested. Um, so that would be sort of the more mechanical right, kind of uh, aspect of things. So there are issues from civil to mechanical, um, much more on the chemical side, of course, you have all the ocean outfalls, so a lot of the uh, um, <clears throat> sewer, uh, the sanitary sewer, they're basically uh, diffused through outfalls, uh, basically pipe that goes on shore. Sanitary sewer and pre-treated to some degree. Uh, similar issues arise with brines from uh, desalination plants, for example. That brine has to go back into the ocean somewhere. A big problem. Um, likewise for um, the brine. Yeah. So I think those are a couple of the a couple of the uh, couple of the points that um, could come up. I was put on the spot. I just saw it five minutes ago. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I guess at this point we'll, we'll just uh, open it to questions. You guys sit down. I'm just I'm just sitting down. 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 I'm just sitting <laughs> um, I mean, that's part of it. A lot of it was, um, actually, I think that's the true answer for my story. <laughs> but, you know, the longer you're in it, maybe you work on disappear. In other words, I used to work in the Caribbean a lot more than I would argue there was no longer Caribbean for the There is some coral, but I. Uh, about 60% coral when I started there, and it's about 6% now. So <clears throat> we're in the Indo Pacific now. But, you know, having seen that, you start worrying about what can you do to intervene in 
positive way with minimal intervention. And, and I'm making an argument now that um, biomedical science can sort of learn how to intervene and help the signal for the body and you know how to fix stuff. And what we've done in nature is say we back off or nature will fix itself. Uh, we will, but we're not backing off. Uh, there's about 27, 28, something like that, times as many people on Earth as when I was born. Everybody using more per capita energy and stuff now than there were. And so this, what Al was talking about, about stuff in and stuff out, you know, we're pulling out all the fish and putting them out. And <clears throat> I think there are novel solutions, but we're going to have to treat things. You don't want to go to the doctor if you have cancer. And then say, you know, exercise more and improve. And that's not going to help you. And that's basically what we say for conservation is, you know, build a park and stay out of it. <coughs> they may, but we don't really stay out of it. So I, I think wise We're not sure how to do that yet, but we've got good ideas. Um. So I know, like this is a problem I'm facing, but I know many other people face this too. But when when we're prototyping with you know, devices that we're using uh, in this space, uh, a problem we run into is, well, one is finding space, but another is like having a continuous water supply and a, and a source of drain, things like that. And, and uh, so it's hard to say I'm gonna build my prototype in a a. Um, Public space and on school on campus. It's hard to set up those systems. Do you know if facilities or people who are willing to be in the space do public facilities are available? That's as well. Yeah, I mean there are there are some uh, hydraulic laboratories, some, some food spaces, and some basin spaces that are available. Uh, and some of it from the civil or sports civil environmental engineering. Um, so do you have like fluids where you know water can flow in? There are some primitive wave mechanisms and so on. It's not very sophisticated, but there are some basic computers to operate in. Um, and there are also college and electrical engineering in bank, for example, works on buildings of autonomous vehicles for the water. So they do have some that water tank that can you know, float around in just to try things out. Um, and in Savannah, there used to be a road dock and there was a pond where actually children used to play around. I'm not sure if that's still available. And then, uh, and then in, in mechanical engineering, in the hub building, that is basically a sort of a uh, kind of space for uh, used to be an acoustic facility, now used for other things. For, uh, but let me let me just say something since you brought it up. Uh, at the end of this uh, this kind of Fire chat, we will send you some material, and among which we'll send you a list of, uh, of what we call the Ocean Vision Fellows for this year. And this is a set of domain experts in different disciplines, from chemical engineering to coastal engineering to ecology. And, and this group of people will represent, you know, a go to if you have questions, if you need additional resources. And so, you know, this is going to be there to help you. So, for example, actually in Savannah, uh, the labs are still there. In fact, Marcus have a big lab that is still there, and it's a, it's a potentially available for you guys to go there and try stuff. You know, there's a, there's still people in Savannah campus, and, and there's a big institution called Scaleway, uh, which is very happy to help students do these kind of things. So, yeah, so Mars place is called Priest Landing, and there and there there's a, there's a plume there, and so there and there's a big dock. And and the dock. But that's been given birth to Georgia now because I. <laughs> so, uh, but they've been, they have always, uh, cinemas that are been very helpful. If you want to know more story, I once bought a boat from Mark. He bought a boat that wasn't larvae, he wasn't using anymore. It wasn't fancy <laughs> enough for him anymore. He was, he was going to keep you at the time. So, okay. that's. <laughs> so, uh, you talked about the heavy sludge, the heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when, if we're going to create a project that's targeting CO2, should we do it like, like there, like make a business model for 
against that that particular fuel source for to do something that's like already like it having already be it having already been approved, how do you deal with that? Like where would you be benefit like where is the benefit? So we usually think that uh turning off the tap is the best thing best solution for any of these things. So really let's let's stop making the problem worse before we try to fix it. So one of the things that reason that ocean cleanup won't work is that we're still putting huge amounts of plastic into the system. Um, so if we can shut that off, a design solution would be much better than the ocean cleanup solution. Similarly with the fuel uh, dealing with the CO2 once it's in the ocean is very hard. But once but if we could use a better cleaner fuel to start with that would be but let me give you an example about that. <clears throat> because when you think of a solution, you know, you don't necessarily have to solve 100% of the problem. So, for example, last year on campus, there was something called the carbon reduction challenge. So, students who were coming on campus trying to figure out how can we reduce carbon. And one team was actually really interested. What they did, they went to Delta and they said, you know what? Your engine never gets clean. And the reason why we don't clean the engines is because it's expensive. And so they convinced the Delta CEO to actually purchase two engine cleaning devices, which were about half a million dollars. And when you made the math of how much more fuel efficient the planes were after they get cleaned once a year, you know, that was way more than half a million dollars. And so they reduced the cost. And at the same time, they also essentially are polluting less. So if you think of these tankers, if you've ever been on a tanker, you'll see that they're not a very clean boat. <laughs> If you want, and I presume that their engines are probably this the, the, the worst of the worst, right? And so even a solution that allows them to, to burn more efficiently or, or even some percentage of reduction in the amount of you know CO2 that they made or other oils and stuff, that will be already huge. Yeah, I definitely echo that. So in thinking about these solutions, don't let perfect be the enemy. So if you can think of a solution that will reduce fuel consumption by 10%. That doesn't sound like a lot, but for commercial shipping, if you told Wallonia for Lumpson you could cut their fuel bill by 10%, they they would make it rain. Because <laughs> that's a lot of money to them. That's the biggest biggest cost they have by a mile is fuel. Same for airlines. So uh, you know marginal changes can add up to big big bucks. And I would be even more in the Delta case, it wasn't even one percent. Still, it was huge. <laughs> Yeah, I have another question about the plastics. Um, if these things are building up in like the, the fish as they consume it and they're not really being filtered out enough, like how do you guys, as we're doing, like, do you guys address this problem in a way? Yeah, that's a great question. So, a, a lot of food that we feed to our animals is wild caught food. So, it's coming in with the native plastic burden. Um, and we're just beginning to look at what the plastic burdens are in the bodies of the animals that we're feeding to our collection animals. And it's definitely something that we would need to address if we find that that's an unacceptable amount. There are an, what we call analog diets, so something that's not wild caught. There are gel diets that can make gelatinized food with the same nutritional uh, components to it. And obviously, we prefer to feed them what they eat in nature. But if we find that there's an unacceptable pollutant burden or plastic burden, uh, there are things that we can do. It's definitely something that people are starting to look at more and more. But a lot of the solutions on the plastic side, again, in the, in the theme of trying to shut off the tap, the, a lot of those solutions lie on the design and material side, coming up with truly biodegradable plastics. You hear about biodegradable plastics. They may biodegrade in a composting environment on land in the middle of a hot compost heap, but they won't floating around in the ocean where most of the ocean is 4 degrees Celsius all the time, which is eventually dark. And they're not going to compost there. They won't. Uh, so we need solutions that will that are truly biodegradable plastics or just some design consideration where the life cycle of the product matches the life cycle of the material that it's made of. All of this problem arises because we use these single use products for a very short period of time, but the materials they're made of are designed to last for hundreds of years. So we've got to get those two things better match so that the product lives as long as you need it and no longer. You just go throughout the water in a different kind of way before you get to the so that we're using artificial seawater at the aquarium. So we use an with a synthetic salt mix and Atlanta City tap water, which is filtered through a carbon filter before we make it. So we're not using any seawater to make these with it. Uh, but there is plastic entering this with it all the time in the food that I'm just coming out. So uh, that's one of those considerations from externality to like that we have to deal with. Yeah. Have you uh, have you tested tap water in the water? 
I have not, but I would be surprised if you know, Dan Beck or the people at EPA have not looked and found. Uh, there's been some studies recently, you guys might have seen one that got a lot of press where they found that a lot of bottled water had 14 to 16 microplastic particles per bottle. So drinking bottled water did not get you away from the plastic problem. It's so ubiquitous now. I was just talking to someone from Patagonia recently, the company that makes the performance quality, <coughs> and they were learning, they were horrified to learn that about a quarter of a million fibers come off your Patagonia fleece every time you put it through the washing machine, and they go straight down the drain into the local waterway, and they're not trapped by uh, industrial wastewater treatment systems. So that stuff ultimately ends up. Actually, the regular water filter filter microplastics are not. Um, not as far as I know, and certainly nothing on the effluent line from your washing machine. Uh, and the conversations that have been had with the manufacturers of washing machines to make modifications to their design, to, there's been zero interest in, in the they don't They see it as a, a cost that's being burdened on them that is not their fault. They're like, well, we didn't design fleece sweaters that shed so much, make a better sweater, and that way I don't have to put this expensive device into every one of my washing machines. So, that so far, the washing machine industry has zero interest in trying to solve this problem. That'd be the washing machine industry, though, right? It could easily be somebody else with an add on because those yeah. pipes plug right into the back of the washing machine. So, you have a little, you can imagine a little plastic filter yep. eventually that just sits there, plug it into the thing, and you're done. Yeah, but then, but then, then you're a yeah. micro thing. I'm not saying it's easy, yeah. just that conceptually. So, if you currently take your dryer lint filter and you clean all the lint off and flush it down the toilet, you are not helping. Just yeah. take, <laughs> take that lint ball and put it in the bin, please. Don't, 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 don't I also it. wanted to mention that there, in my mind, there's a class of solutions that one could say are more indirect. For example, when you talk about fishing, aquaculture is on the rise. And aquaculture is a big problem because you can do aquaculture in a sustainable way or you could just do it in a dirty way. In the dirty way, often what happens is you, you create a lot of pollution but also the fish that you produce is not very healthy. And so the consumers, you know, start to care more and more about what they eat. And so having a way, for example, for the consumer to, to have, and this I'm really fantasizing, some test kits of sorts that allow them to actually verify what they're eating, what kind of fish they're eating, if it's good or bad, you know, that will eventually force the market to adjust and, and provide better quality food. And that's that insight might be. I mean, I know some studies that say something like 60 percent of the fish we buy are not the species that they're labeled. So, you know, some kind of little molecular kit to say, you know, this swordfish is a catfish. You know, would be. I'd buy one. Yeah. For example, one famous study that came out was uh, about salmon. You probably all heard about the, the smoked salmon from Norway, right? Very famous, right? And then when you go in the market, you pay top dollars for the smoked salmon from Norway. It turns out that they had this pen of salmon for so long that they could no longer actually kill the, the bugs by just giving antibiotic. So they went directly putting pesticides in the water. And in the aquaculture industry, pesticides are not regulated as well as they are on land. And the pesticide gets an effect to issue of the salmon. And so now you have this beautiful omega-3 acids that are full of pesticides from the salmon from Norway, right? So those are the kind of things that you as a consumer cannot predict, but these are out there. Uh, you know, like aquaculture, application of cloning is very dangerous. That's something that is causing problems in the ocean. Um, well, generally, I can't think of any situations where chlorine is a big problem. Um, chlorine is a powerful oxidizing agent, so it's a useful disinfectant in certain applications. Um, some facilities use chlorine to disinfect water for marine mammal pools because it's very good at killing bacteria. Uh, we don't. We use ozone in our applications. Um, and I can't think of any situations where chlorine is a problem in natural oceans. It's like the driveway with gas. Yeah, a lot of it, and a lot of it in the case of some of them is just is political will isn't there for some of the things that we're talking about. So for what for good or bad, 
greenhouse gases and climate change became politicized, and that's very hard to deal with. The good news is that in the ocean space, the expression of that phenomenon is basically carbon pollution, right? Ocean acidification and ocean warming, those two endpoints have not become as politicized as the atmospheric analogs that they have. So it's much easier to deal with those issues in the ocean in some sense than it is in the atmosphere. But it still require a significant amount of political work to change it. Policy is hard to get an active and charge with the force, both of those things. Whereas something like Kennedy was talking about, where you inform people that the extra money you pay for Norway salmon is actually a bad idea. Things um, pay attention, you know, the producers pay attention to that, the consumers pay attention to the bottom line. They do in ways that it's much harder to say. Norway salmon out of the U.S. They'll sell it to Spain, and Spain will sell it to them. You know, I mean that's what's going on with soybeans now. They're being sold to Brazil from the U.S. and Brazil is selling them to China because China put a big tariff on our soybeans. But the Brazilians are making money. I like Brazilian salmon. <laughs> <laughs> So to hop on that, like I guess the same thing with the um like the ocean uh warming and the CO2. So I guess if you could come up with a solution that is directly affecting the ocean, but it's not necessarily directly related to ocean, how would that fit into the competition? So like you know, is it turning off the tap? Like if the tap is not Directly point into the ocean. I think it's hard to just uh, talk about this in hypothetical. I think you know the the, the ocean is pretty broad as a concept, and uh, solutions that apply to the ocean are not necessarily direct into the ocean or touching the ocean. So it may be that the concept that you develop that is related with CO2 sequestration may fit you know within the, the broader ocean solution. I mean, the ocean is a big part of the climate system, carbon cycle. So, any, any anything you do to the carbon cycle, the ocean is a big part in benefit for for most of us. That I want us to thank our speakers. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing for the last fifteen minutes? Oh, did you hang around? Yeah. Take a picture of this wonderful group. Yeah, with, uh, with, uh, <laughs> you guys come here and take a picture. Yeah. Uh, marketing, marketing. Marketing. Uh, <laughs>